Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known and worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from Exodus. The Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them, so come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine came out, the mother of, or ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. 
And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Many years ago, in this same pulpit, pulpit, this is a true story, I started a sermon on this gospel one Sunday morning by telling the congregation how much I had struggled with the text that week and how hard it was for me to finally write the sermon. After the service, someone sitting right over here, lovely woman, now long gone, dripping in both southern charm and southern steel, as well as, at least I remember, a good many southern diamonds, said to me, Honey, don't tell us how hard it was for you to write the sermon. That's what we pay you to do. Just preach it, sweetheart, and we'll let you know how it worked out. <laughs> I got the message loud and clear, and until this moment, I've never used those words again. And happily, this time it didn't seem to be so hard. And not because I've been doing it for a long time, but I think I personally am standing in need of hearing this gospel story this day. It's a well-known passage, we've all heard it, about Jesus' attendance at a wedding in Cana, and particularly about his changing a lot of water, about 150 gallons, into a lot of wine. It's complicated enough to try to square this miracle story with our modern consciousness. But this one is also filled with allegory. Allegory making the argument, not missed on those hearing it for sure, that Jesus had come to bring a whole new way of being faithful in the world. And that the old way was passing away. And as you know for religious people, that's never easy to hear. John tells us, that this was the first of the signs that a new wind was blowing into religious consciousness. John also knew, as indeed did his readers and do we, that there were rough waters ahead for Jesus and for all of them. But at this moment, this moment this morning, beyond the fantastical details, beyond the allegory, beyond the rough days coming, this wonderful story rem reminds us of something so joyful about Jesus, and I think I need it, and I wonder if you do. It reminds us of the fullness of his incarnation, how abundantly he embodied life, loving those around him and those children around him. He loved going and having meals with people he treasured. In this season after the Epiphany, I think one of the blessings of the season is that we think of him this way. 
fully present, fully manifested to us as a human reality. I even recognized the dynamic that he had with his mother. Mary assumed that Jesus could fix anything, and even though he sort of tried to blow her off, she wasn't taking no for an answer. She didn't understand everything about her son, but she knew he was special. Mothers are often a lot like that about their sons. Some colleagues of mine several years ago dropped by to see my mother one day up in North Mississippi where she was living. I was not there. After they got back from that trip, they mockingly and repeatedly told me what she said to them about me as they were leaving. As they were going out the door, they said what we do. They said, oh, it's really nice. We, we, we really enjoy working with Buddy and all that stuff. Her answer purportedly was, oh, yes, he's just wonderful. The only thing in the world wrong with him is that he drives a little too fast. She was wrong. That wasn't the only thing wrong with me, and she knew it. But to the day she died, she, tuck, she stuck to her story. I don't think she ever thought I could turn water into wine, though my sister has on occasion opined that my mother thought that I could do that. But that's another issue, and there are not quite enough therapists in this room to get to the bottom of that one. In our wedding liturgy, we hear these words right at the beginning of what we call the exhortation, just after the dearly beloved. We say, Jesus adorned this manner of life, marriage, by his presence and first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Of course Jesus adorned this way of life. Not as the only way, not that everyone must be married, but as a holy way, a way that brings order and goodness to life of committed love. There was quite an outcry a few years back when a Harvard professor by the name of Karen King gave an address suggesting that Jesus might have been married himself. She based her comment upon a recently found fragment, papyrus fragment in Coptic, that when translated contains these words, Jesus said to them, my wife. Well, as you can imagine, a lot of people got real fired up about that. It didn't, I didn't think too much about it. The truth is that for a man in his era not to have been married, particularly for a rabbi in his era not to be married, would have been very unusual. And our scripture is totally silent on it. It's going to remain a mystery probably until we're gone. And it's certainly not one that I plan to spend much time pondering. But what we do know is that Jesus encountered ordinary moments and turned them into extraordinary moments. That is the heart of what sacramentality is about. And we, particularly all of us on this end of the Christian worship world, are sacramental Christians, and we share the need for that. It's perfectly ordinary for two people to be attracted to one another and then to desire to be joined together in a way that is ritualized and set apart to, in our sacramental language, to be made holy. What sanctifies a marriage is the presence of God in that relationship, a presence which is signified by love and fidelity and commitment between two people. God comes to us wherever we are, transforming what seems utterly parochial, pedestrian, into something that is truly eternal, like the love between two people. Love transforms us. A lot of us have known this to be true. It takes us as sort of self-centered survivors of one kind or another and shows us generosity and consideration that we didn't know we could really have. In all its manifestations, 
marital and otherwise. Love is the occasion of celebration and joy. And Jesus rightly knew that this ritual that he was attending that day deserved the best. The best in wine, the best in commitment, the best in everything. The notion of a banquet is frequently found in the telling of the history of our salvation. Sometimes we hear our final destination referred to as the banquet of heaven. All of these, of course, are metaphors, but they're wonderful ones. Remember some, uh, some other soaring words from the prophet Isaiah. I love these. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, or of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. It seems to me that maybe at this moment, in the middle of a pandemic, when we sort of feel like we're not far from a mess in a lot of the parts of our lives, that we need to be reminded of something about the heart of God. And that is that in God's heart, there is a deep desire that we have abundant and joyful lives. Not that we will get everything we want or that we'll have just more and more material stuff, but that we will learn to rejoice in the joy that derives from our loving and knowing and seeking God and loving one another. Jesus said, I have come so that you will know joy like my joy and that it will be complete. Each week when we gather at this table to partake of the Eucharistic feast, our celebration has the potential to be as joyous as a wedding feast in Cana. I think one of the things that we missed so much in the early part of the pandemic was that a lot of us watched that on one of our devices. We miss being in that. This gospel was written many years after the life of Jesus. The story of the wedding feast at Cana no doubt had Eucharistic overtones even to the people listening to it and certainly to us. Like us, they were created to need such sacramental moments and probably practiced an early form of our Eucharistic liturgy. Probably looks a lot like what we do every Sunday morning. Not only the principal act of Christian worship for us, many of us also say that the Eucharist is our deepest connection to God. We can't explain it, but we know we know it. We know it exists. Again, many years ago, in this place, right over there on that rail, one morning I was administering the bread, going from person to person. And I came up to this wonderful little kid, a little boy, about five or six years old. And for some reason, when I handed him the host, our eyes connected, and I looked at him and I said, this is the body of Christ. And with the deepest assurance of anything I've ever heard proclaimed, he looked at me and he said, I know. I know. And indeed he did. We don't believe really that anything literally changes in the elements of wine and bread. But in our hearts, we know that something happens. We know there is a real presence at that table when people of faith gather and we pray these words together that somehow God is there in a way that is particular and powerful for us. Like all the stories in the Bible, this wedding story is bigger than history. It represents to us the fact that God is alive and at work among us right now at work in the world transforming us and bringing us closer to God. 
just like the water in the barrels. We're not the same when we leave the Eucharist each week. Sometimes we're aware of the change. Probably most of the time we're not. But in my heart, I believe we are always changed by it. We come as we are, shuffling, dragging, bouncing, whatever our mood is. We come as we are without pretense or persona. And then inch by inch, this faithful act changes us into the likeness of Christ. This story promises us that into the midst of all that is, both joyful and broken, God comes, and not once, not twice, but again and again, God comes. We don't always get solutions or answers to our problems or even our deepest questions. Probably rarely do we think when we walk back to our PO, well, now I understand. But we always get God. And in the end, that's more than enough. In the name of God, amen. Standing as you were able, turning in the Book of Common Prayer to page 358, let us profess our faith through the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the Son of God, the Father, God of God, light of light, true God and true God, the begotten of the one in the name of the Father, true God. The prayers of the people, Form 6, are found on page 392 in the Book of Common Prayer. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people and their daily life and work. <clears throat> for this community, Chokwe, our mayor, Tate, our governor, and for Joe, our president for the nation and for the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. <clears throat> for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Brian, our bishop, Elizabeth, David, and Buddy, our clergy, for all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially 
Molly Edward and the Edwards family, Harriet Epps, Chandler Ross, Beth, B. Jones, Nancy, Adair Ross, Owen, Hotting Carter III, Tom Lowe, Gray Jeffcoat and family, Mary B. Lanoue, Seymour Pooley, Debbie Copeland, Marilyn, Daryl Montgomery, Ronnie, Tim Mitch, Chris Wells, Cecil Jenkins, Buford Yerger, and Charlie Payne. Are there others? For those awaiting the birth of a baby, especially Caroline and Jared Bond, Caroline and Arthur Walden, Katie and Lee Shirley, Courtney and Sam Peters, Victoria Isaacs Thornton and Chad Thornton, Mary Rebecca and Matt Jeffries, Randall and Martin Shepard, Curry and John Michael Rainey, and Kelsey and Adam Welch. Are there others? For those who serve in the United States Armed Forces, especially Charles, Frank Anderson, Frank Finnegan, Brian White, Bill Copeland, William Hill, William Hansis, Graham Baxter, Gus Carroll, Austin Boroff, Brian Tracy, Rodney, Cole and Austin Bowman, Taylor Ellison, Foster Ogden, and Logan Canaan. Are there others? Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially the examples of our prophet, Martin Luther King, Jr., who taught in the ways of resisting oppression in the name of love and securing for all children the liberty of the gospel. We thank you for new light, new life, and all of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. We thank you for the birth of William Connell Salmon to Bailey and Bryant Salmon. We thank you for the gift of one another. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, especially Robert G. Henson, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, Kelly Wells, Brian Berry, Tri Rosser, and Al Gray. Are there others? Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of sins. Father, in your compassion, forgive us our sins. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Welcome to all who gather here with us and all who gather from a distance. We are honored by your presence and glad to gather together with the people of God. Do not have very many announcements to make other than to just urge you to take a look at what is in the bulletin. A reminder that our 195th annual council has been made virtual. 
So if you are a delegate, we will be getting information about how to chime into that, and it will also be made available to the greater community as a virtual council. Anyone can attend and participate from a distance. Um, our church office is closed tomorrow morning and will resume on Tuesday, and hopefully we will get resume some of the normalcy of our life very soon. What does the Lord require but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? This Holy Eucharist is given to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for the life of Tri Rosser. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses in this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the ruler of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. Said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption, and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, Leah and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your Church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father,
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God, holy gifts for holy people.
on page 365 in the Book of Common Prayer, joining our voices in thanksgiving, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with the spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you grace not to sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. May God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.